Nothing is more powerful than an idea whose time has come. These were the words of French author Victor Hugo, and he was a man with some pretty powerful ideas. So powerful, in fact, that he managed to persuade a publisher to hand over 300,000 francs for the eight-year rights to his epic novel Les Miserables, which is still the highest figure ever paid for a work of fiction. But Hugo didn't just write about revolutionary ideas, he fought for them. Welcome to the Radical History Channel, where we explore some of the heroes and movements who have shaped the world as we know it, and won many of us the freedoms that we enjoy today. Now you might know this Frenchman Victor Hugo as the author of a couple of famous novels, The Hunchback of Notre Dame and Les Miserables. Now I'm really not sure about my French accent here, but it's definitely an improvement on my first attempt. Les Miserables? Les Miserables Les? When he wasn't writing though, Hugo was out there saying and doing some pretty radical things. Even though Hugo wasn't exactly a big fan of the monarchy, he leveraged his writing fame to get himself nominated as a peer by King Louis Philippe in 1845. Hugo then used his position in France's upper house to argue against social injustice and some other pretty radical things for the time like freedom of the press and self-government for Poland. After the revolution of 1848 and the arrival of universal male suffrage in France, Hugo was elected to the National Assembly where he kept on saying pretty controversial things like calling for free education for all children and an end to the death penalty which made him kind of famous internationally. Hugo actually said in a speech that year, you have overthrown the throne, now overthrow the scaffold. By which he meant, unlike last time we had a revolution, let's get rid of this. Hugo wanted to see a United States of Europe, which let's face it would have made him a controversial figure even today. He made a speech supporting this at the 1849 International Peace Conference in France, which was something that he had set up. Unfortunately for Hugo, his campaign for modern humanity was cut short in 1851 when Napoleon III seized power. Hugo made the mistake of calling Napoleon III a traitor to France, and Napoleon III had a bit of a delicate ego on this kind of thing, which forced Hugo to have to go and live in exile. First to the island of Jersey in the Channel Islands, uh, but then he was expelled from Jersey for supporting a newspaper which had criticised Queen Victoria, so he had to move over to the neighbouring island of Guernsey. Seriously, Hugo, shouldn't you try and at least make some friends? In exile, Hugo wrote pamphlets, including one called Napoleon Le Petit, literally Napoleon the Small, pretty much guaranteed to annoy the sort of person who considers themselves a big, important emperor type, and the pamphlet was promptly banned in France. Napoleon Le Petit was the first work to introduce the idea of 2 plus 2 equals 5 as a denial of reality by oppressive authorities, a motif that returned 100 years later in George Orwell's 1984. So just for fun, let's do that one more time. Napoleon, the really, really small. Hugo wrote Les Miserables while in Guernsey, a novel exploring themes of justice, law and love. It was hugely popular among French people at the time and was eventually, of course, turned into the long-running West End musical that you may have heard of. The book wasn't banned by the French government, but it was banned by the Catholic Church, which is probably why Hugo, although he was born a Catholic, developed a little bit of an annoyance towards the established church. Quick interruption, if you're enjoying this video, please do me a favour and click the like button immediately below this video. I'd really appreciate the thumbs up. That helps other people discover this kind of content and spreads the word about radical history. After the American John Brown's failed invasion of Harper's Ferry in an attempt to topple slavery in the United States, Hugo pleaded with the US government for Brown's life. He actually wrote, if insurrection is ever a sacred duty, then it must be when it is directed against slavery. Now there's a hint for people who've attacked the US Capitol recently. Insurrection is not a sacred duty just because you've lost an election. This is one of the things that I love about radical history, the interconnectedness of campaigns. You've got Victor Hugo, the towering literary figure on one side of the Atlantic in France, against the death penalty, supporting John Brown on the other side of the Atlantic in his campaign against slavery. Now, Hugo didn't manage to save John Brown's life, but he did manage to inspire the worldwide campaign against the death penalty. It's important to mention at this point that Hugo was no angel. He quietly supported colonialism in Africa. Apparently he saw it as some kind of civilizing mission because he wanted to see an end to the slave trade on the Barbary coast. Hugo knew though about the atrocities committed by the French army in Algeria and he didn't say anything to publicly denounce them. But he did write in Les Mis, Algeria too harshly conquered and as in the case of India by the English with more barbarism than civilization. 
Hugo's support of both democracy at home and colonialism abroad makes him the classic example of the flawed radical, someone who was way ahead of his time on many issues, but was far from perfect when it comes to modern standards. Hugo made a triumphant return to Paris in 1870, after the downfall of Napoleon III. He was a national hero after his literary successes and his support of democracy in France, and was immediately elected to both the National Assembly and the Senate. During the Paris Commune in 1871, Hugo denounced the atrocities on both sides. He did, though, argue for political asylum for the communards, these were the people taking part in the commune. That was an unpopular view among many. In fact, a mob went to Victor Hugo's house in Brussels chanting, death to Victor Hugo. Hugo had began his life as a Catholic, but when he was asked by a census taker in 1872 about whether he was a Catholic, he replied, no, a free thinker. Hugo was quite annoyed with the Catholic Church for what he perceived as their indifference towards the plight of the working classes under the oppression of the French monarchy. And let's face it, he was probably also quite annoyed about them banning his life's work in terms of Les Miserables and the other books that they disagreed with as well. Hugo wanted to die without a priest or a crucifix, but he did believe in life after death and he prayed every day. In 1879, Hugo made his last public address, saying, in the 20th century, war will be dead, the scaffold will be dead, hatred will be dead, frontier boundaries will be dead, dogmas will be dead, man will live. Hmm, I like the ideas, but when it comes to predicting the future, maybe stick to the day job, Victor. In 1881, in his 80th year, there was a huge parade in Paris in Victor Hugo's honour, and the city of Paris actually named a street after him, which was pretty cool because from then on, letters were addressed to Mr. Victor Hugo in his avenue, Paris. Hugo was a towering figure in literature, but also a patriot and a statesman who shaped democracy in France. Even though he'd requested a pauper's funeral, two million people ignored him and came out onto the streets of Paris to celebrate his life in his state funeral procession in 1885. Two days before he died, Hugo left a final note with his last words, to love is to act. I really hope you enjoyed this video and learned something about the life of Victor Hugo. If you did, please click like below, leave me a comment, I try to respond to as many of them as I can, and of course, subscribe to the Radical History YouTube channel. It also makes sense to hit the notification bell so that you get notified every time a new episode comes out. In the meantime, that's it for me. Keep reading and keep learning from history about how you can make the world a better place today.